We are so excited to have Steve Dunham here with us tonight. He is the Regional Wildlife Biologist at the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife at the Jonesboro Regional Office. Um, he supervises a staff of two biologists responsible for wildlife issues in towns from Idaho up to Vanceboro. He administers the region's animal damage control program, manages 13 department-owned wildlife management areas, monitors 38 department-held conservation easements, and provides regional input on all game and non-game wildlife management within the region. Um, wow, that is a lot. That's amazing, Steve. And if you want to add to that introduction, please feel free to do so. We're really excited to have you here tonight. And I also just want to um, put out a little shout out to Laura, who's in the audience, um, Laura Craver Rogers, and she helped us organize this program. She's the Education and Outreach Supervisor um, for Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. So thank you, Laura. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Steve. Thank you for being here with us. All right. Yeah, no problem. Thank you guys for having me today. I think that introduction summed it up pretty well. So you guys should be able to see my screen now. I think, yeah, let me just start the slideshow. Sometimes it takes a second. Here we go. Oops. Yeah, of course, it'd be helpful if start at the beginning. But um, so yeah, so today um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about wildlife, uh, my role as a regional wildlife biologist. And it's always the question I get asked once, you know, people see me in uniform, it's they think I'm a warden half the time and uh, or they have a fisheries question, but I tell them I'm a wildlife biologist and then they kind of get a blank look and then, so what do you do? <laughs> and uh, I still haven't perfected that uh, that elevator pitch yet, but um, hopefully someday I will. But this, hopefully I can spend the next about 40 minutes explaining it. <laughs> so we'll see how, how it goes. But uh, first a little bit about myself. Um, and by the way, I'm gonna have a lot of pictures and not a lot of text because I, I don't wanna make people have to read more than they uh, need to. But um, a little bit about myself, I, I uh, came to Maine, oh geez, over 10 years ago now. Um, but I came here to uh, go to college and, and um, enrolled in the University of Maine in wildlife ecology because I knew I wanted to work outside and, and ideally I wanted to work with wildlife. And so over, um, you know, the succeeding years, I worked um, as a as a student there. Uh, had a chance to go out on the Bear Den as a student, so I had to throw that photo in there. And then um, had various jobs, summer jobs in the wildlife field. Um, so I, I worked in Moosehorn uh, National Wildlife Refuge down here, down east. That's where I, you know, really got my first taste of of being down east and and uh, this region. Um, I also worked in uh, northern central Maine, so up in like the Telos region, just just east of Baxter State Park, um, with snowshoe hare, and and then later actually returned there for my graduate work with spruce grouse. So this is spruce grouse there in the middle top, um, and then I've also had uh, the chance to work at Baxter State Park. I was an interim naturalist there. For, for a bit and um, got to a real, earn a great appreciation for that park. Something that I, you know, I had been to it before as a, as a trip leader in, in college, but it never really um, just grew an extra, extra appreciation having worked there and really uh, understand the, the role of that, that such a large uh, section of protected land can, can play. Um, and then also, I, you know, even though I, I have the job I have now. I still volunteer, and so that photo of the of the owl is on a on a opportunity to volunteer with um, Sawwood Owl Banding. So that was a, a you know I volunteer, but having three small children at home, I have to make sure my volunteering occurs after hours. So, <laughs> anyways, um, so that's a little bit about me. And so, really, the dream for me was always to become a, a wildlife biologist. And so, luckily, back in in uh, 2019, that that dream of being a, a regional biologist for the state came true. And and I started down here in the Down East region. Um, and my family moved down. So my wife Leanne and my my three kids, uh, Walden, Barrett, and Micah, uh, we all moved down. And now we live in in Columbia. Columbia, Maine, and that was on Tunk Lake 
Uh, the skating was amazing just a couple weeks ago. And we finally got that week of winter. So I don't know if anyone else down east enjoyed that one week of, of winter time. But so again, back to the question. So what do you do really? Um, that's a lot. Um, we'll start at the, at the very basic. So the one slide I, I'll have you guys read, but um, so that's the mission statement of the department. And so essentially it's protect and manage fish and wildlife and then all the ways that people enjoy them. So, um, you know, recreation, sport, and also uh, science. And that's what we try to do here at the department in a nutshell. And then to kind of get down to where I am, we have a little bit of bureaucracy we have to work through. So we have the department, and then within the department, you have bureaus, as you know, government is divided. And so um, within, I work under the Bureau of Resource Management. So as it sounds, we. Uh, we manage wildlife resources and then within that we have the wildlife division so i work specifically with wildlife and then within under that division um there i am down under region c so we have seven regions in the state um and that is the bulk of the of the wildlife division is the regional management um program and that's divided into the seven management regions across the state and so i'm we are down here in region c there's some folks i know tuning in from bradley and other places that'd be over in region b um but the bulk of the folks i think are going to be in this this down east region so i'm down and i'm currently in jonesboro at the headquarters um and so yes we go all the way down to the down to blue hill peninsula and all the way up, like I said, to Vanceboro. So uh, quite a large area and you don't get to all the corners all the time, but it is fun when we do. Um, so one of the one of the major things that we do in this in this region is we're we're a land manager. So just like Blue Hill Heritage Trust or Island Heritage Trust, we have land that we manage um, and that those come in the way of wildlife management areas. And so, like you said, there's 13. This, this map only shows 11, I know, but some of them have some complicated public access. So we didn't necessarily put them on to the, uh, onto the list yet until we could kind of sort them out. But this, this is actually a new tool that um, our department's I&E um, just launched. And it's going to be really helpful for pointing people to get to some of these, because unfortunately some of, our wildlife management in areas can be a little tricky to access, or at least uh, the access may be right next to a house, down, down what appears to be a driveway, that sort of thing. And so um, this is a great place you can go um, onto our website and, and find the, um, the link to find the details on how to get in to and access these management areas. And, and kind of what those look like on the landscape. These are two examples. The down east um, manage, wildlife management areas tend to be a little bit smaller than some of the other other regions, but um, we do, like I said, have a number, and they're kind of uh, most of them are are really wetland based in this region. Um, so we have, for example, Bog Brook um, on the left of the screen there, and that's entirely wetland. It's actually uh, the definition of of what is the management area is a elevation of water held back by a dam. So um, that is the entirety of it. And we um, perform brood surveys on that um, this past year. And, and actually, and I know it's just one year data, but we had some of the highest counts of wood ducks. So I'm hoping to get back there next year and see if that, that continues. So um, it seems like there's actually a lot better wood duck production than we initially thought. It used to be the site of a, one of the largest uh, heron rookeries, unfortunately no longer, but there's still quite a few osprey and a bald eagle that, that enjoy hanging out there. And then of course there's the Jonesboro Wildlife Management Area, which um, we are in. We're in that um, little middle triangle below Route 1A. Um, the cleared areas are Forest Service Building and, and our headquarters here. And then um, the other thing that the Jonesboro site is known for is in the upper two units, the northern two units, uh, you'll see um, some blocks. Uh, it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but essentially grouse blocks were put in there in the 70s and, and maintained for a number of years. So, um, and that's kind of what we do on our, as a department in the wildlife management areas are managed for habitat. 
um, predominantly. That is the mission. That's how they're acquired. Um, it depends, you know, sometimes depending on the funding source used to acquire these, we may be required to do certain things. So um, if it's an upland um, site, that, you know, for we may, for instance, we may need to um, manage for upland species. If we acquire it with uh, wetland funds, you know, we, we would be required to, to maintain, um, you know, wetlands and wetland habitat. And so some of the activities that can happen are um, grouse blocks or habitat blocks, as you can see on the top left. These were areas where early successional uh, habitat is, is created by, by essentially clear cutting a block and then letting it regenerate. Um, and then you do this in a pattern so that you have different age classes available because woodcock, for instance, are gonna display in the clearings, um, but then they're gonna raise their young in a, in a younger forest. Um, and then they're gonna feed in a slightly older forest um, where there's less, uh, more open ground, you know, where they can probe the soil um, for worms and, and other insects in the ground. So that's, that's one uh, common one. Um, I know Fry Mountains, the, the famous, uh, also the famous uh, management area for a lot of grouse work. Um, and then we have nest box, we provide habitat in the form of, of nest boxes. Um, so here, um, that's actually from Lyle Frost, this photo was taken this year, we went in and reinstalled a box that had blown over last year, um, and checked on two others uh, that we had in the area. And although the, the nest box uh, program down this way has kind of come and gone as it has in many areas uh, over the years, sometimes, you know, groups came in and said they were gonna, <laughs> help maintain them and then that's kind of fallen off. So there was probably a time there was about 80 of these uh, across the landscape at any given point. And, and now, you know, we're just down to a handful. So it's one thing we're looking to, to bring some of those back as well. Um, and then uh, we also have a ton of apple trees in our Cobbs Cook region, uh, our Cobbs Cook WMA, which is, is actually several um, subunits, they used to all be independent uh, wildlife management areas, but were all quite small and all centered around Cobbscook Base. We, we ended up for ease of management, sort of rolling them all into one uh, overarching unit. And there's a ton of old farm fields and apple trees that are, have gone. And so one thing that we do is prune apple trees or make clearing, um, open up the forest around these um, so that they can continue to produce fruit and support birds and deer and, and all um, other forms of wildlife. And then there's also some uh, food plot planning that can happen to help again, support um, deer and other, other uh, turkeys and other wildlife on our management areas. And then of course, when you're a land manager, you also have to do some less fun things like remove trash or coast. Uh, so there's, you know, some folks may be aware, it's maybe not that any island owned by the department that's not associated with an onshore uh, wildlife management area is part of what's known as the coast of Maine uh, wildlife management area. So there's there are several islands that the department owns um, that are predominantly managed for seabird nesting um, or other similar habitat. And um, unfortunately, if you're, <laughs> as you guys know, on the coast, the a lot of garbage washes up with every storm. And so uh, we can fill our boat pretty much anytime we go out to these with um, lobster traps, buoys, bottles. Um, and it's, it's quite a thing. I will say the number of bleach bottles seems to be going down as more and more people are boiling traps. So that's a nice, that's a nice thing to see. Um, and then uh, we did have a fun sort of trash removal with, we actually removed a cabin off of Hog Island in Machias Bay. And so the Forest Service helped us out. We got to ride in a helicopter and go out and fly off uh, about about a little over a ton and a half of, of material um, before destroying the cabin um, and taking it, you know, removing it from the island. Um, and then we have, you know, down to just having to put signs up and maintain boundaries and um, do all of the sort of day-to-day -day, uh, maintenance of these of these facilities. We also have trails, Cobbs Cook. Um, Bay Wildlife Management Area features many units that have hiking trails, walking trails. Um, and although, again, you know, the, the priority for these, these 
areas is for habitat. We, we understand that some of these historically had roads or trails in them, as well as, you know, there are, there are other forms of recreation besides hunting and fishing. And so we, you know, we do try to provide some level of um, where appropriate of hiking access as well, or walking. Um, so that predominantly in our Cobbs Cook region, and we are a member of the Cobbs Cook Trails group um, and work with other land trusts and organizations in order to you know, provide that access. So the other, the other thing that we spend a lot of time, especially in the spring coming up, so this will be uh, on everyone's mind, is animal damage control and technical assistance. So, um, you know, just a heads up, the, the bear and the, the moose and this are fine. They're asleep in these photographs. Um, so they are not, they are not deceased. Um, neither, neither were deceased, both were released alive. Um, but, you know, bears are a big thing in the, in the down east region. Um, the peninsula, the way the coast is shaped with these multiple peninsulas, and the fact that everyone wants to live on the outside and not on the interior of these peninsulas means that we all the way down the coast have constantly these little pockets of habitat surrounded by homes and they become kind of the perfect places for bears to go hang out and then they figure out that they can have a den in the middle and they can kind of just meander around the outside and and find food where they where they may and as well as obviously you know the predominance of blueberry agriculture um down here which involves beehives and um and so there's obviously places of conflict there that's actually that center photo is a is a fence charger one difficulty with the sandy soils down here is a grounding rod doesn't work very well and so um they this was a an attempt from to actually use chain link fence as the grounding so the bear would have to step on that and then touch the wire and would get zapped and therefore be educated not to then break into the um, the beehives on the other side of the fence. So one way we can try to minimize those those um, conflicts that come up. Beavers are the other real popular <laughs> uh, animal call that we get in the spring, especially. Um, so over on the on the right on the top, you see. Um, a water control device. Uh, Beaver Deceiver is actually a trademark name. It was a, it was a group that developed a, a, a water control device um, in Maine, actually. And so, but uh, somewhat sometimes commonly referred to as a beaver deceiver, but it is actually a water control device. And so the water enters that pipe and flows over. The beaver has since dammed it up all around the pipe, but as the water level gets to a certain point, it'll, it'll still flow through that pipe and, and keeps it from getting going further up the lawn of, of the nice woman that lives uh, nearby and, you know, getting into her well and, and slowly flooding her basement. And so, you know, we, we worked with um, U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service or APHIS, their wildlife services branch. That's a lot of letters and names, but they are the federal um, animal damage control uh, folks, and they do a lot with this. And this was a this is also on a road, and so DOT was involved, and that's why it got all the way up to having having APHIS involved. Um, and so we work a lot with them on on things like that, as well as other um, animal damage control agents that we certify um, through the department that then go out and take care of a lot of the on the ground that we just can't get to as you know three biologists um, in the Jonesboro office. But we do occasionally have issues where we need to tranquilize and, and move bears. So that's the photograph there, as well as this moose that actually got into a, a penned area and couldn't get out. Um, and so um, I couldn't just open the pens because there were other animals in there. And so we had we ended up having to uh, dart that moose and move it. And it was uh, released and, and it was a healthy. We originally thought it was a cow, but it turned out to be a, a button bull. So that was a pretty interesting, interesting day. So chasing a moose around a pen and um, getting a dart in it. And then um, ospreys nesting on telephone poles with the return of all of the uh, river herring um, really increasing along the coast. We've been really seeing a strong uh, presence of osprey in this, this part of the state. And so um, unfortunately they really like to make nests on poles and 
it ended up being terminal for this this osprey it ended up being electrocuted but luckily the, the partner osprey was able to continue feeding the chicks and the chicks survived um and, and did fledge and i believe um Burson was building a going to build a platform there uh, to keep them off the wires because it's not beneficial for the power company either it's a it's a can be a real fire hazard um and um kind of the next thing that we also work on a lot is environmental review so anytime so um and one aspect of environmental review are forest management plans so there's obviously a lot of forest land down east um you know, Blue Hill Heritage Trust owns some forest land as well. And so as you write a management plan, especially if you're looking for the um, the tax credit for having um, just forest land and, and having a management plan, um, then those plans get sent into the, the main natural areas program for review and they get sent to us when they interact with certain areas like deer wintering areas, inland waterfowl, and wading bird habitat, so wetlands that would support breeding ducks and breeding um, marsh birds, um, as well as significant uh, vernal pools, rare amphibians, all of that. And so we, um, we are sent these plans and we review to make sure that there's language in the letter to, that addresses you know these potential habitats um, then that they that they have that information as they develop their forest plan and so for instance on a inland waterfall and wading bird habitat there's a 200 foot buffer around that habitat that within 75 feet we would really prefer that there are no harvesting happen and that maintains um, a forested buffer around around the wetland and then and then within the next from 75 to 200 we would like to see partial harvesting so no no reduction uh, greater than um, about 30 percent or so to to minimize how much um, potential runoff there would be or um, temperature effects on incoming water um, and so that's uh, just an example of, of some of the things that we put into those reviews. Um, we also have our Natural Resource Protection Act. Um, and so the DEP is in charge of enforcing the rules in there, and that outlines certain habitats um, that are, are protected. And that would be higher moderate value deer wintering areas, higher moderate value wading bird and waterfowl habitats, which again have the buffer shorebird feeding and roosting areas, seabird nesting islands, significant vernal pools, endangered or threatened species habitat, and also tidal wading bird and waterfowl, which is um, essentially for seabirds and shorebirds that are feeding along, along the coast and along mud flats. They kind of give you a, it's kind of a lot, but so DEP actually does the actual review. What our, what uh, me and the other two biologists in, in the region do is simply um, get looped in to comment on the, those processes and help inform DEP's decision down the line. So they are actually the, the agency that makes the decision, but, but we comment on, on how we feel that that will impact um, moving forward. Um, and so for an example, um, folks, if folks are interested in own land, they can, they can look to see what's on their own land by going with beginning with habitat and um, it's publicly available and shows any of the, the habitats that would have um, a legal ramification as far as, as um, being protected. And so, for instance, on the far right, we have tidal wading bird and waterfall habitat. So this is a photograph of a shoreline stabilization project. And so there's no buffer associated with the habitat, but obviously the work extends down into the mudflat because you to put in the work, you have to be in the mudflat. Um, to stabilize the shore and so you know that's one that we comment on and we we want to see that that kind of silt fencing and, and reduce how much sedimentation is is happening um, when a project like that goes on um, or we have an inland waterfowl wading bird habitat in the middle and you can see kind of what that would look like on the landscape um, a mix of open and, and shrubby wetland um, that is probably providing some excellent nesting habitat 
Um, and that's something we want to protect and, and promote on the landscape. And then this blob of orange um, to the left is, is uh, upland sandpiper habitat. And so it's actually uh, an area of blueberry, blueberry land that's maintained for blueberries and, and providing uh, known um, upland sandpiper habitat. And so that's, that's a, you know, a, a state threatened bird. And then of course we have public appearances like the one I'm making now. Um, we, you know, make here Josh, one of the biologists down here, is is talking about um, some furs and skins and skulls with some some students. Um, or we may be at um, some sort of outdoor gathering um, or event. Um, the sportsman show is a common one that the department always makes an appearance at. Um, uh, a lot of times a Pleasant River um, fishing game club, other fishing game clubs that may have orga have organized events um, back when we, hopefully someday when we can have in-person outdoor events again. Um, and then the real fun, fun work that we do down here is the data collection, research and monitoring. So the, some of the hands-on work um, that people think we get to do all the time that we wish we could, but, um, so turkey trapping, uh, last year we were banding turkeys as part of our efforts of putting uh, metal bands on, on turkey legs that are then later recovered um, by hunters and that helps us get understand um, hunter success um, and return rates and, and a, a number of things and so it actually it was also a study on band effect, efficacy so we had butt bands and then bands that had a rivet in them. And so that was a sort of a test within the test. Um, so we captured in this instance here, we captured over 30 birds at one time with a rocket net um, and then put them into boxes and processed each one and released it. Uh, we also banned ducks. Carl is banding a duck there in the center photo. He's the other, one of the other biologists in the region. Um, got a chance to do a moose flight. Moose density down east is very low. We don't typically run the moose flights down here, um, just given the lack of habitat and the lack of, of moose density. But it is one thing every now and again, we'll, we'll get a chance to go out and see how many are, are still on the landscape. Um, and some peregrine falcon monitoring. So that's Ironbound Island there, um, if anyone's familiar. And there was a, there was a, a nesting peregrine um, on that cliff. I'll give anyone a hundred dollars if they can see it in that photo. No, I'm just kidding. It's <laughs> completely uh, cannot see it at all. But, and then in the bottom left, uh, doing during a lynx, or bottom right, sorry, during a lynx survey, we came across um, a snack that the lynx had had. And so some small mammal had unfortunately become food um, in the middle of a, of a clear cut. So we followed these, these tracks. We were uh, snowmobiling down a road. Um, that's how you you look for tracks in the winter time. It's an easy, effective way to cover a lot of ground. And and we found where the tracks cross the road. We stopped and followed them for a bit, winding through this this clear cut. And sure enough, it was winding around for a reason. So it found itself a little snack. Um, and we also do some disease monitoring. So there is a photo of a of a, a moose brain. So sorry if anyone's offended by that, but. Um, in cooperation with USDA APHIS again. Um, They're the ones that monitor for rabies in the state. Um, it's mostly north, so not so much on the uh, on the Blue Hill Peninsula, but um, in the far eastern part of the region and then in the north of the region, um, roadkill are collected and tested for uh, rabies if the if the brain is intact. That's where rabies exists is in the salivary glands, spinal cord in the brain. Um, and so uh, that we, we do send several animals uh, to, through them. And then the main CDC will test if there's been an instance where either a dog um, or, or a human owner has come into contact with a suspected uh, rabies case. And then the Northeast Wildlife Disease Cooperative is a group that the department works with um, and we have a, vet, a veterinarian we can contact whenever there's suspicion of, of you know an abnormality or a potential zoonotic disease so a disease that could 
be in a wildlife population and then jump to a human population. So that is something that we do. Um, it's you know not a not a, a main thing, but it is you know during especially this time of year we've come across uh, several brainworm moose. Actually, just yesterday um, had to had to put a moose down, um, and so we we'll, we took samples. We do an acre remove the brain and, and um, we take some blood and they're developing a blood assay. So the ability to test um, blood to determine the presence of the meningeal worm or the brain worm in the brain. Um, and that's a lot faster than the previous method, which was remove the brain and try to find these, uh, these tiny, tiny organisms, um, which is obviously very labor intensive. And so as part of that, we document the signs that we're seeing on the ground document um, the brain and then send the blood. And that way they can kind of use that to help create that, um, that process to, to identify, you know, the markers in the blood to, that are associated with the infection. And then we have uh, one that we get a call a lot about or get a lot of calls about in Maine is, is uh, the uh, papillomavirus. So the wart, you know, warts in humans, um, is can create uh, fibromas in deer and so these are essentially like really ugly warts um, on deer they're not necessarily life-threatening unless they happen in a place like the eye or the mouth um, but they're not fun to look at and obviously people get very concerned when they see this but uh, it's a perfectly healthy animal it just has uh, basically a really gross wart on it unfortunately and so um, it'll live a, a full, full, happy life, um, and actually, that that condition can get better. Um, they can, they can revert. And then, um, sort of one of the other things that we have in common with a lot of the land trusts around here is conservation easement monitoring. And so, um, we hold conservation easements. Uh, there was a time when that was the only method we had to protect. Land. Now we 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 usually try to acquire land if we're if we're interested in protecting it ourselves. Um, but this was a tool that was used, and, and so we still maintain these conservation easements. Some of them are actually on land trust properties, and then there are some properties we own as a department that have uh, conservation easements held by other land trusts. So there's a lot of cooperation and and, and swapping of uh, information between. Some of these conservation groups and ourselves, um, and so, you know, we visited these. If they're ones that was acquired with state monies, we are required to visit them at least once every three years. Um, obviously, we would try to get to them sooner if we could, but uh, it, it does become with 38 in the region, it becomes quite a burden every year. And some of them, like uh, Tunk Lake, is over a thousand acres, and there's well over a thousand acres in Tide Mill Farms, so. Some of them just are are absolute bears, and the federal ones we have to we have to do every year, and so we have about eight of those, I believe, in the region that we need to do yearly. So, again, we visit these properties and and make sure that the terms outlined in the easement are are not being violated, and then when they are, we have to address it and, and move forward. So we've had a few of those, unfortunately, but they've all so far been remedied um, and um, otherwise it's you know uh, can be a really fun excuse to get out and enjoy a day on uh, on a piece of property that you would normally never uh, get to visit and so that can be uh, an exciting treat and then you know again with the coast there's unfortunately sometimes a lot of floatsome that sort of ends up on these properties so and kind of with that, that's about what I had. I went a little bit quicker than I hoped, but that's any questions or information. Our contact information is there for the three of us. Our phone number will be changing here, but that's the you can still use that for now. And I'm sure there'll be a, a correction once the new one comes out. And then our emails for myself, Josh, and Carl. So anytime anyone needs to get a hold of us, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much, Steve. That's awesome. If it's all right with you, I'll put these con this contact information in our follow-up email so yeah. um, people can access it that way as well. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. And we absolutely do have questions in the chat box. So maybe Jake Good. and I can um, filter through them and 
try and get to as many as possible. And again, if you'd like to ask Steve your question, as Jake mentioned earlier, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, okay, we have questions pretty far back, so I'm just gonna yeah. <laughs> scroll. Yeah, there's a lot of chats. Uh, yeah. I, I can, I can, I'm scrolling through too, and I have one for memory that I can ask Steve. Um, one of our Perfect. viewers asked if, if, you know, if there's land that is in uh, conservation, how is it protected from, um, specifically from like motor motors and stuff, like if it's water, mm -hmm. right? Because technically I think the land, the land surrounding the body of water is in conservation and then it gets a little trickier with different depths within the-, the um, Yeah, yeah, that can be tricky. I, to my knowledge, the only, you would have to have a restriction on that particular body of water instituted by the department. So for instance, this came up a while back um, with um, a pond in Great Pond Township where folks desired to have um, a horsepower restriction put in. And so they would petition the commissioner and then the commissioner would decide um, whether that was appropriate. The bulk of our horsepower restrictions are typically a 10 horsepower restriction on the body of water. Um, and so, and I feel like most of those occur in the, in the um, Acadia area region. Um, and there are, there are smattered across the state, but there are not that many in total. And they're all in, um, you know, listed through rule, the rulemaking process is how that, that works. And so that's, yeah, just because it's in conservation doesn't mean it's necessarily protected. Now, if, you know, if something was put in, I suppose there could be, if it, if that was worked into the deed language, um, I don't, I'm not aware of any properties that certainly that we have that have such restrictions, but um, that's how typically a conservation easement you know, it would be one of those situations where you've sold a certain right. So um, say, but it's usually development. I don't know that I've seen one for, for access. And of course, the, the federal properties like the refuge, they have, they have wilderness with, you know, we call capital W wilderness. So that's uh, a legally defined um, wilderness. And that has horsepower. That actually has no wheeled conveyance. So technically a wheelchair wouldn't be allowed in there. Um, and, or a, like a wheeled deer cart. Um, and so those, that's a, that's a legally defined, you know, wilderness, um, and as such has a, you know, a whole bunch of rules that you have to follow, but again, that's a federal property. Complex, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for the answer. And then there was another answer and then maybe Lander, we have a raised hand, um, but uh, should wolves be reintroduced into Maine? I thought that was an interesting question. Yeah, well, I think that just definitely depends on who you ask. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, part of the trick there too is we, I mean, we also now have coyotes. And so coyotes are, are not native to Maine, but we say they're naturalized. Um, and so they, they weren't introduced, you know, they're not um, invasive in the sense that they were brought here and, and left and just went rampant. Um, they, they came on their own, just like um, possums, for instance, which are, you know, being seen all the way near Bangor and, and slowly spreading into the state. So, you know, these are animals that have just through time worked their way in here and, and filled, filled a gap um, in some ways. And, and, you know, that sort of changes the dynamic on the landscape to some degree. And um, you would have to convince a lot of people <laughs> introducing predators is never never a uh, easy situation um, would it be more more natural perhaps but the forests and and communities of today's maine is very different from the the communities of of when wolves were here on the landscape um, right and I'm but there are occasionally things. wolves that are seen um, i do have to address that i know we get reports every year and, and there is always the potential that a wolf uh, could actually make its way um, from Canada. The, the, the predominant thinking is that they don't cross the St. Lawrence because icebreakers prevent the ice from uh, going all the way across, but it does occasionally happen. So uh, they, have, they have been seen, but there is no breeding population to our knowledge, so. Interesting. Thank you. Yep. 
Um, so I don't see any hands currently raised, um, but I can go to another question in the chat box. We have them flowing in. Um, so have the, the areas that you mentioned, Steve, in your talk been purchased by the state or given? So it depends, uh, both. <laughs> Um, so some were purchased, actually, we recently just purchased uh, two properties in Maine, um, one as an addition to the Lyle Frost, we added about 80 acres to Lyle Frost that was that was purchased, uh, we were approached by an abutting landowner that um, was was willing to sell and and wanted to see it go to the department to be conserved. And then there were two parcels in Harrington, actually, that in an area where we didn't have any other land um, that some folks were interested in selling in, into the apartment. And so we did, um, we did actually purchase those. And again, those purchased using grants. So we used a, uh, the parcels in, in Harrington were purchased with um, uh, waterfowl or yeah, wetland grants. Um, and so specifically for that title, um, water, wading bird and waterfowl habitat, so the marshland along the coast. But we are occasionally given properties as well. Um, you know, either someone has passed away and, and willed it to us or just decides out of the goodness of their heart to donate it um, to the department, and that does occasionally happen. Um, I do see one question, if you don't mind. One about tick damage to moose population. Um, yeah. That's that's an interesting one. Uh, we were just looking at that moose yesterday, and it did have ticks on it. But by um, if you were to look at northern Maine, it was not a lot of ticks. For down east Maine, it was more than we all than we necessarily see. Um, but the the key with the ticks is density, and so there are not as dense a population of moose in this region, and therefore we don't tend to see the winter tick densities as high uh, down here. Um, because they are they are closely linked, and so if if we had a higher density, then we would then we would see more damage. So really, down down this way, it's um, brainworm is probably more of a concern given the interaction with deer mm. and and wet wet areas on the landscape. And Steve, I, I have a question quick about brainworm. I mm -hmm. think that is I think one of the common behaviors for that is that they'll walk in circles. Is that am I correct mm -hmm. in saying that? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's common. Yeah, they always present a little bit differently because it depends on where in the brain is sort of being affected on the moose. So some go downhill really quick, others kind of have it for a while. Um, but yeah, it, that's a very common towards the end as they, they kind of start circling. They may lose their sight um, and kind of stumble and bumble. Um, the one yesterday, unfortunately, we believe it broke its leg probably um, and then couldn't get up after that point. So it was about it was about a four-year-old cow. Uh, she was quite large. So um, you know, once, once that leg was broken, she really couldn't stand up anymore. And so uh, it was better to, to end it. Definitely. Nature is sad sometimes. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to keep track later, but there's a, there's a lot of questions coming in for you, Steve. Uh, yeah. Someone was inquiring mm -hmm. about the, the word heritage in your mission statement and what, that might, sure. um, what the usage of that word might mean just generally speaking? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think in the in terms of the mission statement, the outdoor heritage is, is the long standing history of, you know, um, connection to the land um, through um, hunting and fishing, traditional uh, uses as well as you know industry really I mean for a long time it was based on that um, outdoor you know um, either the harvest of, harvesting of wildlife or timber or you know and so this state had a has long had uh, a history of being outside on the landscape um, and so that's really kind of what the use in that of, of the term in that instance is that makes sense. Thanks, Steve. We do have somebody who's raised their hand. Sure. Um, so Bob, if, if you intentionally raise your hand, I'm going to allow you to talk and you just have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm just wondering uh, if you have a inkling as to what the status of lynx population is down east. Sure. Yep. 
Um, yeah, we actually were able to get out twice this year looking for lynx. Um, and we do try to get out a few times every year, but with the snow conditions, it's we haven't had very good tracking snow, but there are um, lynx basically north of Route 9. Um, you, the likelihood of seeing a lynx increases greatly. Um, I'm told there was actually one hit by a car in Columbia Falls a number of years back um, before I got down here, but we don't really see them below nine very frequently. We did look this year in the Osborne area and didn't come across any, came across a lot of bobcat tracks. And that's typically what you see is the um, bobcat and lynx don't tend to interact in the same area because lynx can out, the theory is the lynx can outperform them on snow. And so they, and they're highly territorial. And so you don't usually see, there's usually a pretty hard line between bobcat and lynx. Um, obviously there's some, some interaction on the edge of, edges of um, range, but there are, there are links uh, in the down east region, but again, predominantly over uh, north of Rudin. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Bob. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a question a little bit further down that I just wanted to jump to for a minute, and then maybe we can go back, or Steve, if you see questions you want to answer. Um, somebody from our board is asking, do you have particular habitats you'd like to see our two land trusts conserve? Oh, shoot, yeah. Um, well, I have a personal affinity for wetland habitats. I think that's one that gets, um, does get a lot of attention, um, but they tend to support just a vast variety of, of wildlife species, you know, birds, bats, amphibians. Um, we've done a lot of work um, over the years with, you know, bat monitoring and we've been focused on our, our own properties predominantly, um, but you know, in these wetland areas, and that's where we're seeing a lot of them is you know, kind of those um, on the edges. And so um, definitely a big proponent of inland, <laughs> of inland wetlands and also shoreline. Uh, you know, this coast is not heavily developed and, and keeping it that way as long as we can <laughs> is, is going to be great for you know all of these shorebirds and, and um, uh, seabirds as well and waterfowl. Thank you, Steve. So, Steve, uh, we we had talked a little bit about uh, testing uh, roadkill for yep. commonly uh, for uh, rabies, and mm -hmm. someone was inquiring about how often does that actually come up positive. Um, that would be a good question. We have sent a few raccoons um, and, and it, it is fairly common. Um, basically they don't, the reason they don't test the Blue Hill area is because they know it's present. So, um, you know, essentially if you have an animal that's acting as if it has rabies, there's a good chance it does, you know, once you start getting kind of west of the uh, Sullivan area, or yeah, west of about Sullivan, right down the coast. So um, it's just kind of, you know, we know that, that it's around and on the landscape in there. And so um, that's part of it. You know, the other thing that they can have is distemper. It's really hard to tell the difference between the two. Typically we test for rabies and we don't really test for distemper um, because it's a little more complicated. You have to send like the whole carcass down to a lab. Uh, down to UNH um, through the disease cooperative. And so that doesn't usually happen unless we have a specific concern around that. Um, it's usually the rabies because it can, you know, because of the human health uh, concern. But the um, APHIS would be the contact there since they're the ones that actually do all of the testing. But I do know from the handful that we've sent, um, you know, uh, several have come back as being positive. So. It is around. Um, we have another question. Which main animals are most threatened? Oh, geez. <laughs> oh, probably um, some of our insects, actually, just because nobody really thinks about them as much. You know, we have um, bumblebees, and they've been working on bumblebee um, atlas the last several years. Um, obviously, you know, spraying of herbicides and everything else can be a big threat to, to those native pollinators and, and insects. And so that's probably one that gets less attention than it really should. Um, but as far as, as other animals, um, yeah, it's, it's those and, and then the animals that are on the edge of their range. So, um, 
you know, spruce grouse are pretty good right now, but anything that's kind of either at its northern extent or southern extent are are the species that are going to um, be struggling the most. Thanks, Steve. There was a question about chronic wasting disease in the deer yep. population of Maine. Yep. Yeah, we haven't had any. We test every year. That's one of the things, um, one of the, some of the data that we take, we, we collect biological data from deer and that informs our harvest, uh, next year's harvest um, goals and, and numbers. And as part of that, we subsample for chronic wasting disease. And we usually focus that in areas that we know feeding, which concentrates deer happens like large feeding operations or where there's a game farm. So where, you know, farm raised deer happen. And so um, we take samples from wild deer around those areas and send them out every year. And, and thus far, hopefully it stays, we have not had any positive comeback. So we, there is none in the state currently, but we are always watching. I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, sure. And there's one from Christine. What are the trends in duck populations, including hooded mergansers and are monitoring techniques sufficient to accurately track numbers and trends? Oh, and hooded mergansers. Yeah, that's good. I don't know that we really have enough to, that would be a good question for Kelsey Sullivan, our, our, uh, our game bird biologist, but, um, but yeah, we, we have seen a few down doing our, our brood surveys here, but yeah, I don't think we have enough, at least in this region in particular, to really get a good handle on, on that. Um, but statewide, we might have, have a better sense from both harvest and, and brood surveys statewide. Um, I do see a question, uh, perhaps the wolves might control the coyotes. Uh, yeah, but wolves also eat a lot of other things too. So um, yeah, it is possible, um, but they do coexist in other, in other places. Um, maybe, I don't know, I'm not, personally opposed, but I, I certainly am not going to speak for, for everyone. Um, and speaking of predators, what about the puma? Yes, we get a lot of uh, mountain lion sightings. A lot of them do turn out to be bobcats and or house cats. Um, from, you know, I don't have any, any evidence to go off of um, other than you know, what someone's seen and, and, you know, I, what I always tell folks is, you know, I'm, I'm not saying you're a liar, um, but, uh, you know, we don't have a breeding population in the state, you know, it would have come up on a game camera, there would be more tracks being seen, you know, there would be more evidence if there was a breeding population, but it doesn't mean that an exotic pet got out or one came from South Dakota, like the one that was hit um, in, in Connecticut a number of years back, you know, they were able to track that all the way back to South Dakota. So it's not, you know, what I say is it's not impossible, but it's unlikely and, and more, it's certainly not a breeding population, but we do get a handful of, of accounts every year. And some of them are, are fairly credible. Um, but you know, we, we haven't had any really solid evidence thus far, but that's always a popular discussion point. Thanks, Steve. Uh, yeah. we had Two, two kind of conflicting and interesting points. There was one, um, one viewer who said that they've seen a lot of um, snow hair tracks and in, in also have seen a lot of bobcat tracks. And then we also had a viewer who said that they hadn't seen any snowshoe hair tracks. So are there, is there maybe like a, a shift going? Are there something yeah, changing? Some, some of that has to do with, you know, the habitat that's around too and, and shifts that have happened. So places that had a lot of, snowshoe hair may not anymore just because the habitat has changed over time. Um, but, you know, in general, I would say it seems as though the number, you know, and again, that's, it's just off of kind of anecdotal, but does, they seem to be up, um, not necessarily a huge highs or anything, but they're pretty common on the landscape. And, um, as far as Bobcat, I know from, you know, the fact that we, we do tag fur here, and so we have bobcat that come in that are harvested. Um, you know, there are, there, and then all the calls we get because people see them, you know, in their yards, especially this time of year, as, as you know, if they have, especially if they have chickens or anything else that's outside that looks like a yummy treat on a snowy day. Um, 
you know, there are quite a few bobcat in, in the region. Um, and so there's a good, a good healthy population there. And uh, I did, I, I reread the, the duck uh, question again, sorry about that. Um, it was, um, we do, we do track numbers through harvest and um, our breeding um, surveys. And so um, I kind of focused mostly on the, on the hooded merganser portion of that question, but yeah, the, the tech, the technique we use are returning of bands um, from marked ducks, as well as, um, you know, the, the hunters have to, when they buy their license, they fill out a, um, questionnaire about what, how many they harvested, where, you know, eat, how many did you bag in the previous season? Are you going to hunt this year, et cetera. And so that's another way to track. Um, cause obviously they don't get tagged at a tagging station. Um, but that's, that's one way we track some of that harvest data. And then we do have the, um, you know, breeding, uh, information for Maine as well as uh, other places in the flyway. Um, and so, that's a it's a regional effort um and so the game bird biologist works with the fish and wildlife service and other other partners and they and they develop those seasons um and manage and monitor trends uh all together thanks thanks for revisiting that question steve that was awesome Somebody was asking, um, I think you mentioned a button bull moose and they were wondering yeah. what that is. Yeah, so if, if you've heard the term button buck before, it's it's usually a, a young deer that just has two little knobs. Um, that's all that you can really see. So it looks like a doe from a distance, um, but they have two small small nubs, uh, usually, you know, that year's, that year's uh, male fawn. Um, and so that was kind of the situation here. It could have been that the velvet had been damaged. It was a, it was a fairly large moose, um, but it wasn't huge. So, you know, it's kind of, it could have just been a kind of a fluke. Um, but yeah, he had just these basically two knobs on the top of his head, um, but they, they didn't turn into anything in the shape of a, of a normal antler. They were, you know, quite hard and you kind of dragging his head along the fence trying to get out. So. Well, any other questions that we missed before we, well, we're just hitting the hour now, but if there were any oh. last. Yeah, they said, how long did you attend college? So I did a, I did a four-year degree and then I did go back for a master's degree. And I don't want to say how long I was there, but I took a little longer than most probably, but, um, uh, but it's something that, you know, um, one of my colleagues here does have his master's degree as well. Um, and the other does not. So it's, it's not necessarily a, a case of you know needing to go to school for a certain amount of time a lot of it has to do with experience and and jobs and um but definitely at least a four-year degree um is certainly beneficial and that and, and pretty much necessary at this point and then um you know just getting out there and 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 getting some experience um it's the next next best thing thanks steve Awesome. Oh yeah, and then uh, a question about fish, pa fish passage. If I have time for just maybe, I guess we're a little bit over, but um, there is talk about adapting dam fish passage. Yes, we do. Um, we have several. We own several dams, and on almost all of them, we do have fish fish passage. We don't on all of them. Um, and that's for uh, a number of reasons. One thing is the reason we maintain these dams is to maintain water levels for waterfowl. So, you know, I, I'm a I'm a wildlife biologist, not a fisheries biologist. Um, and so the focus of these wildlife purchase properties is for waterfowl and maintaining steady water levels during the breeding season. And so, so the priority is always there. But on some where we can, we do and we do. Um, have fish passage and on some we don't now and we may never and on some we may sometime down the road um, some of these dams are quite old and just didn't have the capacity for it honestly and then in some we have concerns about um, bass and other other um, less desirable species um, moving into areas so 
Thanks, Steve. May, I yep. think there's there's one last question that, that somebody reminded us of. I think it was back first yeah. about managing for pollinator habitat. Yes. And maybe yep. what we'll do is we'll, we'll end with that question and I'll make sure mm -hmm. that everyone gets Steve's follow-up um, contact information so that if you have questions, you can reach out to him and to other people that he suggests as well. But yes, the pollinator question. Yeah, yeah. Um... Certainly, yeah, there's definitely, um, I didn't see what the actual question was about managing for pollinators, but um, we, there have been work in the state to do that. Um, actually, um, some of the land trusts in the region, Down East Lakes Land Trust is one, for instance, that has done this you, as there's money through NRCS. Um, so Natural um, Resource Conservation Service, and they um, can provide funding to create pollinator habitat. So, you know, the shrubs and plants that pollinators are going to use. Um, and actually that was an interesting one because they couldn't really afford to cut the, the trees down with their big equipment. So what they did is they just opened it up and allowed people to harvest firewood, uh, as much as they wanted out of certain areas until the area was clear. And then they could, till it over and plant um, pollinator species. So it is something we, we have thought about. Um, there are certain areas that it would be a really good idea um, and certain areas where it, it might not be as, as effective, but it is uh, one of the things that we're starting to think about moving forward. Hopefully that answered it. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. I know uh, Clear Heritage Trust is applying for, for one of those grants. So yeah, excellent. That. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much, Steve, for being with us tonight. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this was great. Really great to learn about all that you do for this whole region. Um, and we will be sending a follow-up email with a recording and contact. Um, and we hope you all have a great night. Thank you for joining us. And thank you again, thank Steve, you. for being here. Yeah, no problem. Have a great night. Good night, everybody.